So I, I am here in his place. Um, today's lessons gather around the theme of God's deliverance of a needy people because of Jesus. Uh, he is Zechariah's messianic king who comes to deliver those that are held captive in that waterless pit. Uh, he is the psalmist's Lord. Uh, who upholds all who are falling and failing, all who are bowed down. And he is the one on whom the wretched one cries out for rescue in Romans chapter 7. And it is Jesus who offers us his yoke that binds us with him for learning and for rest. Deliverance is today's watchword. Let us worship our faithful Lord together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose words are always sure. Amen. Amen. We confess that we have sinned, we have hurt, our community. We have squandered our blessings. blessings. We have ordered in our county. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned, we have failed to be honest, we have lacked the courage to speak, we have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are free and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, serve you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Zechariah, starting at verse, or chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will, will restore to you double. Word of God, word of life. Thank you. 
Our second reading is Romans chapter 17, verses 13 through 23. And Rob helped me out a little bit this morning. Uh, this was a little bit confusing how it started out. And so a couple of extra sentences, I think, will put it a little bit in perspective. So the law itself is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. So did something good bring death to me? Absolutely not. It was sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to Matthew 11. Glory. 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 At that time, Jesus prayed, I confess you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to the untrained. Yes, Father, because this brought you good pleasure. All things are handed over to me by my Father, and so no one knows the Father more completely than the Son, and no one knows the Father except those to whom the Son chooses to reveal God. Come to me, all of you chosen ones, who are beaten down, weighed down with troubles, and I will relax you. Take my yoke on you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble. You will then find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy to manage. Its weight isn't difficult to carry. The gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. gospel lesson from Matthew 11 in issues the living Lord's invitation to his followers, weary from their daily struggles with temptation and doubt, carrying a boatload of worries about many things, to come to him for learning and for soul rest. 
Now, if you are here and, and, and perfectly relaxed without a worry in the world or without any burden to bear, then my homily is not for you. <laughs> if, however, you are stressed out, if you struggle to remain faithful to God, if you carry in your hearts or on your backs the weight of caring for yourself and others, if you find getting old as difficult as I do, <laughs> then listen up. Because today's gospel lesson proclaims good news for you and for me. An initial observation about Matthew 11 to get us rolling. Jesus uses in verse 28 a pair of participles in his invitation to come to him for rest. I've translated them beaten down and weighed down. Both these verbs express a world weariness typically used in Jesus's world for the physical exertion of Palestine's farmers and ranchers or sometimes about the emotional effects of ending a day exhausted inside and out from all that one is asked to do. It's the kind of daily experience captured by the lyrics of Eric Clapton's great blues track about a life torn down almost to the level of the ground. All of us have experienced this kind of torn down life. We've all ended a hard day with heavy weariness in our souls, a total exhaustion of body, mind, and heart. Now, many Christians have identified with the portrait of the wretched man of Romans chapter 7. But the pairing of Romans 7 with this morning's gospel lessons needs a word of caution. In my reading, the lectionary nudges us in a wrong but well-worn direction. Paul's use of the first person is not autobiographical. It's not a depiction of his own spiritual struggles, nor is it an expression of the spiritual struggles of any Jesus followers who struggles with sinful thoughts, or with disobedient actions. Now, other biblical passages talk honestly about that struggle with sin that we all experience. But Paul doesn't in Romans 7. His use of the first person I here is a rabbi's rhetorical device used to dramatize the internal distress of the non-believer who seeks after God but mistakes God's way of salvation as paved with noble attempts to obey God's law in the hope of feeling God's pleasure, but without God's help to do so. The point Paul scores in Romans 7 actually has its beginning two chapters earlier in Romans 5 with his retelling of Adam's story that introduces his, his two evil twins, sin and death. We already know that Adam disobeyed God's law about the fruit trees and paid the price for his sin, death. We know that all people who have ever lived have followed Adam's lead. We all sin, and we all pay the same price for our sin, which is death. But we only can get to today's lesson in Romans 7 by way of Romans 6, where we read, where we have read over the last two Sundays, the truly inspiring message about God's forgiving grace because of Jesus. Now I think, and I've told some of you this, that Romans 6 is the finest essay on God's grace ever written. Period. Word. During its 2,000 year history of being read and proclaimed in the global church, demonstrates that Romans 6 stands at the very 
part of Scripture's story of God's victory over sin and death because of the dying and rising of Messiah Jesus. The story's plot line is simple to follow. God sent a second Adam, Jesus, into the world to liberate all of creation from the grip of the self-destructive sin set in motion by the first Adam. By entrusting our lives and our futures to this second Adam, Jesus, we participate in his death that forgives, frees us from the power and guilt of sin, but we participate also in his resurrection that baptizes the forgiven into a new and extraordinary life with Christ. Now, Paul's various opponents did not like this radical message of God's grace and so bombarded him with questions that Paul systematically answers throughout his letter to Romans. The opponent's question that begins and frames Romans 6 is perhaps the most famous and consequential of them all. Paul, they ask, if God's grace really does liberate us from the wretchedness of our sins because of Jesus, does this mean that we can keep right on sinning so that God's grace can keep right out of bound? on abounding for our sake. And Paul's famously profane retort is, hell no! <laughs> Real Jesus followers don't continue in sin because they participate in the glorious results of Jesus' death and resurrection, which frees us from sin. Not only, not, not so that we sin all the more, but so that we sin no more, right? That's the gospel truth, and God don't lie. Now we can talk about this, but the real point here is that we now walk with the risen Christ. We participate with him in the working out of our salvation. We don't deal with the crap of life by ourselves or on our own. Jesus carries one end of those heavy burdens, and we carry the other end as we trod down life together. When Brad begins worship by pouring water into the bowl, baptism, he does so to recall our baptism into the death and resurrection of Jesus so that by entrusting him with our lives, we will be sanctified by God's grace to engage in good works that are free from the tarnish and rot of sin. Now it is against this backdrop of Romans 6, cued by Romans 5, that we are able to hear more clearly the three poignant cries sounded by that miserable wretch depicted in Romans 7, who attempts to please God on his own without the Spirit's empowering help to do so. This cannot be the cry of one who has been set free by Jesus, according to Romans 6. These are the wails, the pleas, the shouts, the cries of someone who is desperately seeking after God's salvation, but has yet to find the grace that enables him to do so. The first cry is one of deep frustration. Verse 15, he cries, Lord, I do not understand my own actions. I do, I, 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 I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. Which leads to the second agonizing lament of verse 24. Lord, I am a wretched man. 
who will rescue me from the distorted mess sin has made of my life. It's difficult to capture the extraordinary anguish of the man's cry. Paul uses the word translated wretched, but it's a word that combines a Greek word for continuing with another for misery to create a word picture of a person's irrepressible distress that devours and disrupts every nick and cranny of his life. Unforgiven sin, a graceless life, affects everything we do, how we think, how we feel, what we say and do, what we worry about, how we spend our time and money, a total misery that totals our life. But he is awakened to the realization that he has reached the dead end of life, total misery, and he calls out to God to rescue him from death. Who is to rescue me in this time of need? The word used for his rescue comes from the Old Testament's elemental story, Scripture's elemental story, of God's rescue mission of Israel from their death camps of Egyptian slavery to set them free. Not only to go to the promised land, you know the first reason they are set free? To worship God. To worship God. To worship God and to make their way to the land that God has promised. And it's this memory of the Exodus that evokes that final cry this one of thanksgiving that God has indeed rescued him from that waterless pit of death because Jesus Christ has become his Lord. And it is that note of thanksgiving for salvation of the forgiven man of Romans 7 that sounds the fanfare announcing our arrival at Matthew 11. Where Jesus invites all of his forgiven followers to come and to take his yoke upon their shoulders for it is easy to put on and it is light to wear. Now Jesus knew all about yokes. Not that he was a farmer, carpenter. And he built yokes with his dad in their carpentry shop in Nazareth for the large farming combines of Galilee where he lived. Now yokes were heavy beams of oak that farmers placed on, the, on a pair of oxen to control their movement when plowing straight lines in uneven fields to plant and harvest crops most efficiently. Although heavy yokes restrict freedom, they always intend to produce good results. Even if the word yoke is sometimes used negatively in scripture as a metaphor of oppression, it's used more often as a metaphor of something good that binds or yokes us together as they did oxen for a common work, a good work. This is what Jesus has in mind in our gospel lesson when he refers to my yoke. By entrusting our lives to the risen Lord, we are bound together with him, yoked together with him, in the working out of our salvation. He is bound with us to share our burdens with us. He 
each like variable. Now, yokes produce good results, and Jesus tells us of two that result when his yoke is placed upon us by grace through faith. The first is that we get to learn from God's Son, who knows everything. God's Son knows everything. And that's true of the arts and the sciences. It's also true of Scripture. It's true of everything. And he becomes our teacher. The curriculum Jesus uses is based upon what he has learned from the sovereign creator, who is his father. And this curriculum of divine learning is not the ABCs we learn from the wise and intelligent experts. Important stuff. I'm a university faculty, so it's important stuff that prepared us for our careers and citizens. But we receive the wisdom of God from the living Jesus as we study his scripture, as we worship and pray, as we sing the great hymns of the church, as we receive the Lord's Supper together. We learn through worship the ABCs of God's vision for all of human life. Wesley puts it, that we learn how to live holy and happy from Jesus. Holy and happy. The learning outcome of, the, of this divine curriculum, we continue to learn from Jesus through God's Spirit, is that of a transformed and transforming understanding of ourselves, of our neighbors, of our world, in ways that seek to redeem all of us from the wretchedness of life with and for Christ. Now the second productive result of this yoked life with Jesus is rest, shalom. Our burdens are never ours alone to bear. We are paired with Jesus for life makes our loads easier to bear. We do not need to request the Lord's help. We have it. Right? We have it. We do not need for his resurrection power. We have it. In the indwelling spirit. The anxieties that seem to grow with old age are lightened because Jesus has already placed his yoke Across our shoulders to join ours with his. A shared life that results in our rest. To experience soul rest is to experience God's salvation, creating power at work within us by the Spirit, who gives to us, in Paul's memorable words, a peace that passes all. already have been rescued from this torn down almost to the level of the ground kind of life. We are no longer that wretched dude of Romans 7. We are the forgiven disciples of the risen one who gives to us new life. We now need to entrust those lives to him and lean into the shared life he promises us. My friend Paul Brueggemann reminds us that the strangest thing about the Bible is God. The God who loves us, the God who is for us. Let us make this season of Pentecost the right time to embrace our new life with our risen Lord and become what we already are, spirit-enabled instruments of God's righteousness. Amen. Amen.
please stand if you're able, and we will declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. God, who gives us rest in Jesus, give us the vision to take up Jesus' yoke that we might bring you glory and enjoy your rest. Hear us, O oh God. God, who gives us rest in Jesus, show us the desires of our hearts and help us to turn from all that unsettles us, drives us to consumption, and feeds our fears and dissatisfaction. Hear us, O oh God. God, who gives us rest in Jesus, thank you for the beauty of gardens, zoos, and wildlife sanctuaries. Thank you for trusting us with your beloved creation. Bless all who value and implement creation care. Hear us, O oh God. God, who gives us rest, in Jesus. Look with compassion on refugees and all parts of society experiencing daily unrest. Guide government leaders to work for justice, mercy, and reconciliation. Hear us, O oh God. God, who gives us rest in Jesus. We know those whose burdens are impossible to carry without you. And so we uphold Joanna and Ed, the Schuberts, the Haywards, Bill and Barb, Marlene, Alexi and Alyssa, and really all of us, Lord, that you might help us to live daily within your nurturing rest. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of rejoicing, you have brought us together to worship around word and liturgy and sacrament and hymns. Lead us all to places of renewal and refreshment. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O oh God, we command all for whom we pray, in the name of the one who reconciles all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with all of you. Let's uh, intermingle and share the peace with one another.
with him we can. Let us pray. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us, that the world may be fed with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <clears throat>
God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. the cosmos and speaks in the smallest sea, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the very end of this age. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you.